Welcome back, everyone. This is lecture number 20. We're going to talk about antivirals. Remember last time we talked about vaccines. Vaccines can prevent viral disease, but usually don't have much effect if someone's already infected. And of course, you know the exception, rabies, where we can vaccinate after the the virus has already come in you. So what do you do if you don't have a vaccine or you haven't been vaccinated? Well, that's where antivirals come in. They can stop an infection once it has started. Although in some cases, as you know, or probably suspect, you can't go so far after the infection and then it becomes too late. It depends, of course, on the infection. However, we don't have a lot of antiviral drugs. People have been researching and developing them for around 60 years. We only have about 100 on the U.S. market, and the timeline for their development is shown here. Now you can see the viruses are few. HIV, hepatitis C, herpes viruses, influenza, respiratory sense issue, HPV, and uh, hepatitis B virus. And look, I mean, the first antivirals came out in the 60s. And then here we have discovery of HIV in 83, HCV in 89. Then the look at the pace of HIV drugs. We have the most uh, HIV drugs, 41, uh, followed by hepatitis C virus. And that's a recent addition, as you'll see today. We'll talk about that. Herpes viruses, influenza viruses. And so most of these drugs are against HIV, hepatitis C virus, and herpes viruses, which of course, of course, all cause persistent infections. And so that is one thing that you'll take away from this is that it's a lot easier to develop drugs for viruses that cause long-term infections than acute infections. Why is that? Well, you have a lot of time to diagnose and treat, right? And you're infected for life, so you can treat for a long time. Acute infections are tough. Here's a breakdown of the antivirals that we have by uh, vir virus and target. So on the left, the viruses, you can see HIV-43, the most, uh, followed by hepatitis C virus, uh, and then herpes viruses. Uh, when you look at the target, it's quite interesting here. The polymerase is the biggest target, whether it's a DNA or RNA virus. Uh, we have 27 antivirals that target the polymerase, and the protease is next. Uh, and then, you know, there are other targets like integrase, NS5A of hep C, and others, but then there's the host 10 drugs targeting host uh, targets. And that's the, the breakdown in the third part chart, pie chart. Uh, 75 antivirals are against virus targets and 13 against the host. This The host is small because it's hard to find a, a host target that won't compromise the host when it's inhibited. But we're getting better and better at doing that. So why are there so few? Quite a few reasons. First, um, the uh, most compounds uh, that uh, work by inhibiting virus growth, they can, they can affect the host cell because there may be proteins that are similar uh, in the virus and the host, such as proteases and polymerases. And so you have side effects as a consequence, and th these are typically unacceptable. We try and keep them low. And remember, every step in reproduction requires some kind of host function. So it's very hard to separate them, although not impossible, obviously. And for other viruses, uh, we can't grow them. Very hard to grow hepatitis B virus and human papillomaviruses. Some some viruses are dangerous where there's no animal model. Smallpox, there's no animal model that we can use. We can't even work with it, really. But we do have two antivirals now that have been developed in the U.S. in the in the past uh, 10 years or so, which are being stockpiled. Why? Be you know, the, the virus has been eradicated for in case of bioterrorism. If there's an outbreak of smallpox, we have antivirals and vaccines stockpiled in the U.S. to take care of most people. So they were developed without having an animal model. And then dangerous viruses like Ebola virus and Lassa virus. It's very hard to develop drugs, but not impossible, as you will see. But the third reason is that a compound has to block replication completely. It has to be potent. This is not the case for standard pharmaceuticals that you may take if you have a headache or muscle ache, for example. They don't have to do 100% inhibition of the target. You know, a, a little bit is enough to make you feel better, but not acceptable for uh, 
viruses. Partial inhib inhibition is no good because if you partially inhibit, you're going to get resistance right away. So that's illustrated on this graph here on the right. We're looking at viral load versus time. You give the drug at the dotted line, the optimal dose will completely inhibit virus reproduction. But if you give intermediate or low doses, the virus will not be fully inhibited. You'll select for the emergence of resistant variants. So that's not good. And so this, is, this makes it hard. It's another layer of, of making drug discovery hard. And that's why we don't really have any SARS-CoV-2 antivirals. Really hard to do and takes time. And of course, acute infections are short and tend to be shorter. They don't last the life of the host. And, you know, some like influenza, a week, SARS-CoV-2, two weeks. And typically by the time you feel ill, it's really too late to make a difference. You know, SARS-CoV-2, when you get symptoms, the, the virus is at its peak already. So uh, you have to give antivirals quite early in infection, which means you have to be able to diagnose, which is like a catch-22. You know, the companies will not make antivirals because there's no diagnostic tests, and they won't make diagnostics because there's no antivirals. It's like one is waiting for the other. I mean, you could give antivirals prophylactically, but we generally do not like to give drugs to healthy people. The an exception, of course, is pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV AIDS, which we'll talk briefly about later. Now, if we had a broad spectrum, that would be great. So we had one antiviral that could inhibit all viruses. So you get sick, they would give you that. But of course, what if it's a bacterial infection? Then we go the other way. Right now, physicians prescribe antimicrobials when it may not be a bacterial infection. So it's, it's not easy. We need to have rapid diagnostics. We're getting there. I'm hoping the pandemic has pushed us to getting even better technology for that. So that's the problem, that until you have a rapid diagnostic, it's hard to have antivirals. But as I said, one day we'll have a mirror that will diagnose you in the morning, and you'll pick your prescription up on the way to work, and that will revolutionize. We'll have plenty and plenty of antivirals, even for short duration, like common colds. So let's talk a little bit about history. Uh, the first searches for drugs uh, to inhibit viruses started in the 1950s. You know, we had the, the explosion of antimicrobials after penicillin, sulfonamide, antibiotics. And so people began to, to synthesize drugs like thiosemicarbazones. They were active against pox viruses. Smallpox was still a big deal uh, after World War II. So people wanted to ha find antivirals to supplement vaccination. But it wasn't until the 1960s and 70s that the efforts were increased by what we call blind screening programs. What this is, is, I'll show you in a moment, just massively screened collections of chemicals to find things that inhibit viruses. And as I said, this was all started because of the success in treating bacterial infections with antibiotics. So what is blind screening? Well, the name means there's no focus uh, on a particular protein. It's just, let's take this virus and see if we can find something that inhibits its growth in cell culture, and then we'll figure out what the target is and make it better. Many companies have thousands and thousands of chemicals stored away that they've made, and they're labeled. You can go to them and check them. You can look in dirt. Many companies take dirt and make a, a fermentation in, in the lab and see if there's anything in that. My wife used to work at Merck, and whenever we went on vacation, she used to collect dirt from various places. She would get a GPS coordinate, put it in a Ziploc and bring it back. And if they ever found anything, they could go back and get more. What you're generally getting are microbes in the dirt that are fermenting something. Um, you know, ivermectin was famously found in a, in a dirt sample in Japan produced by uh, a microbe. So then you have chemicals or, or natural product mixtures, which would be dirt or grass or water or something like that. Yes, yeah, so you ask, do they, this, do they block virus reproduction in cell culture? Um, then you would fractionate those and find out a single compound, which we would call a lead. You would try and modify it chemically and make it better to do all sorts of things, make it more potent, reduce toxicity, and so forth. So that's blind screening. Um, we made lots of molecules before you would ever find something useful. So a lot of effort, very little success. One exception was this drug, uh, amantadine which was approved in the 60s for treatment of influenza A viruses. And it's one of, of multiple drugs available for treating influenza. And uh, we talked about this in the entry lecture a long time ago. It blocks entry. Uh, 
but that wasn't found out until the 90s. We didn't know the mechanism of action until many years after uh, this drug was developed. It's not used anymore because most isolates uh, are resistant to it. Now, today, antiviral discovery has changed completely. No more blind screening uh, because of recombinant DNA technology and highly sophisticated chemically, chemical chemistry. Uh, we can target discovery to single gene products. We can clone the viral genes. We can produce the proteins. We can solve their structures. Since we know the reproduction cycles very well of many viruses, we can decide what part we're going to intervene. And we can uh, get inhibitors even for viruses that cannot be propagated in cell, although at some point you're going to have to decide how far to go. You know, with smallpox, there were no animal models, as I said, so it's not simple. And so we have inhibitors that block basically every step of the reproduction cycle. As you know, we can divide it into these steps to study it, like attachment, penetration, uncoding, mRNA synthesis, uh, processing of proteins, uh, nucleic acid replication, that's a big one, integration even for HIV, assembly and release. Here on the right are examples where there are inhibitors of these viruses that can block at each of these steps in, in the reproduction cycle. So I will go through some of those with you today to explain how they work. But first, let's talk a little bit about how you discover drugs. This is the path. You start with a medical need. You have to decide that you have a medical need. And as I said before, you have to have a good number of infections and serious illness. And you do some research and you identify some targets that you'd like to inhibit. You an, an enzyme, for example, or some step in reproduction. And you have to show that if you inhibit it, it would block reproduction. So if you can make a deletion in the gene, that would be useful. Uh, and then uh, you have to design ways to inhibit it. So a lot of research goes into that until the point where you then screen collections uh, in very, very specific mechanism-based or cell-based screens, which I'll explain in a moment. Natural product collections, compound collections, combinatorial chemistry, even uh, RNAi. So you can do actual screens in, in cells, or you can do it in silico. You can have a computer run through compounds that would fit into an active site and then design compounds based on that. So you make a number of hits, and then those are further modified for better activity. You make lead compounds, and then you advance them uh, eventually to a drug candidate. You test them in animals, uh, and then all of that information goes towards testing in humans, what we call clinical testing. It's a long and complicated process. And some of the things you, you want to address in these later stages when you're modifying the compound. So we are just doing this for a virus inhibitor with a small company, in Massachusetts, they sent us, you know, last year, a, a compound that they thought might work. It inhibited our virus, and now they've made 20 different derivatives. And we're going to see if they can get better. What kind of properties? Well, bioavailability is important. If you take it by mouth, does it go to the right place in the right concentration? Uh, does it persist long enough? Pharmacokinetics, and will it be safe? Toxicity and specificity. And you need to sort all that out before you go into people. You have to do toxicity in animals and figure out, you know, how many milligrams per kilogram uh, you will eventually put in people. This is not a cheap process, and it takes typically a long time. So here's a kind of a concept graph where we're looking at all the compounds that you're starting with on the left, and then you, you systematically throw out the ones that don't work, don't, don't have antiviral activity, the ones that are toxic. They don't have antiviral effects in animals. They may be toxic. You could find a great drug that inhibits in animals, but maybe it's toxic. Forget it. It's the end of the line unless you can modify it. And, you know, chemists are very good at knowing how to modify compounds now to make them less toxic and last longer and so forth. And then with all this preclinical data, you do your clinical trials. Typically, you've now narrowed it down to one, but it may not work, and you may have to go back and try others uh, again or again. The toxicity, we test first in a phase one. And if it's acceptable, we can go on to bigger phases. And this can take 10 to 15 years for many, many millions of dollars. And, you know, we did not accelerate this for SARS-CoV-2. We had vaccines made in less than a year, uh, but no antivirals. We looked at a few old ones that had been around already, but we didn't make anything new. People are working on this process, 
but it's going to be a while before any of them uh, come out. I don't think they're going to make an impact uh, on this outbreak. So just th by throwing $24 billion at vaccines, we got a bunch in less than a year in the U.S., but the money wasn't thrown at antivirals, and uh, it's, it's going very slowly. The, the different phases are shown in this graph. Clinical trials, of course, are needed for vaccine testing as well. We didn't really talk about that, but uh, the same set of, of tests for drugs. Here we have our discovery and synthesis preclinical studies in animals typically. Then you start a phase one trial, typically with, uh, with a few healthy subjects to just make sure it's safe at the levels that you want to give it based on what you found in a couple of animal models, two presumably. If that works out, then you do a phase two, which is efficacy in a, in a one or to 300 subjects. And then then the, the data are reviewed and it's made a decision whether to proceed to a phase three, which would be for efficacy. And throughout all of this, we're looking at side effects. And in some cases, superiority. Is this better than what we already have out there? If not, it won't be licensed. It really has to be better. And this can be thousands of subjects. Finally, the data of all of these are given to the FDA, which will then uh, either license it or not. And then you have ongoing studies in people uh, where you observe for many years to make sure there are no untoward effects. And in the case, always safety is the overriding concern when we do this. So let's talk about a couple of different ways you can screen for antiviral. The people are very clever about this. Remember, you have to go through thousands and thousands of compounds. So here's a mechanism-based screen. Where we're looking for an inhibitor of a protease. We're looking for a small molecule. Typically, these are all small molecules, so they easily enter uh, the, the organism in, in cells. So we've got the substrate for the protease, a, a couple of amino acids, including the cleavage site. And on one end is a, a compound that's going to make a signal, like fluoresce or make some kind of a signal that's readable with a machine, and then you have a bead at the other side. So when the protease cleaves this, you can remove this part by centrifugation, and you can take the supernatant and read, read out. And if, of course, if the drug inhibits, the bead will still be attached to the fluorophore and it will get removed from solution. And here's a, a typical example. We're looking at minutes here and fluorescence intensity, intensity of the soluble peptide without the drug it's all cleaved into solution with the drug you're inhibiting it. So you can design screens like that. That's done in solution. Here's a mechanism or a cell-based screen. We can use cells here. We're using bacteria, which have been engineered to be resistant to tetracycline. So they have a, a multi-pass uh, protein in the membrane, which pumps out a tetracycline. It's a tetracycline efflux protein. And we've inserted a protease cleavage site for uh, the HIV protease. So these bacteria will be resistant to TET. And now if you produce the protease in the bacteria, it's going to cleave this and inactivate the pump, and, and these bacteria will be tetracycline sensitive. So no colonies will grow in the presence of TET. Uh, and, but if you have an inhibitor of the protease, you will now get colonies because it won't cleave the protease cleavage. So you can go through many, many compounds looking for ones that allow bacteria to grow. Just two examples of some very clever uh, screens that you can do. Now, what is it that you screen? Well, you first of all, this is, these are all done by robots now, so you can screen tens of thousands of compounds a day. You can screen your chemical libraries. I remember at Merck, they used to have hundreds of thousands of chemicals stored away. It's just a matter of weighing them out and uh, trying them. Natural products, you can still get some companies interested in that. Or you can make your own compounds. There's what we call combinatorial chemistry, where you combine chemical linkers and fragments in making arrays of all different compounds. Each of these linkers and fragments are different chemical entities that have been selected to have good properties for binding proteins. And so you can make all different variations of these by combining them in different ways, and you can screen those. You can also have a structure of your target, for example, three-dimensional structure, you can look at the active site and try and design compounds that would fit in it, perhaps based on the natural ligand. And sometimes you can have a computer just churn through the active site and model compounds to fit in, and then you pick the best hits and you synthesize them and see if they actually work. And as I said, this is all done by robots. You can have plastic plates with many, many wells in them, 
Like this one has uh, 1,500 wells. These are 384 and 96. And the robots, these arms will pick up uh, trays containing these uh, microfiber plates. They will load them with the reaction mixtures. They will put them in incubators and they will read them out and transmit them so you could sit home and get the results of your screen uh, as it's going along. It's quite, quite really uh, revolutionary. These are very expensive, of course, but it's, a, it's an investment to make because they can be repurposed for many different uses. All right, so let's have a, uh, a question here. We have many antibiotics, but fewer antivirals. What's the reason for the difference? Robotic screening is slow. There are a few serious viral infections. Resistance is a problem. Antivirals must be potent. All of the above. The answer is D, the antivirals must be potent. Now, resistance is a problem, but it's not why we have so few antivirals. It doesn't prevent us from making them. It's because they're difficult to get them 100% potent. Robotic screening is not slow, so that would automatically rule out E. Robotic screening is really fast, right? Well, let's talk about resistance. Someone, someone just asked, and you can pretty much anticipate you're going to have resistance to any antiviral that you make. Why? Because viruses replicate very efficiently, of course, and they have anywhere from modest to high mutation frequencies. And this is a big issue in chronic infections or persistent infections, right? They the virus is reproducing your whole life. And so it's hard to avoid resistance. And we have resistance to every drug we have already. There's no antiviral that we have for which there is no resistance. And if we make 10 next week, we'll get resistance. If we make 100 next week, we'll get resistance. There's just so many viruses out there, it's inevitable. And this is kind of a problem because... You know, we don't have a lot of antivirals, and if you get resistance, you may not have an alternative. You know, fortunately for HIV, we do, but that's not the case for, for all viruses. So what, what's the problem? You can't treat the patient with the drug if they come up resistant, right? You have to change the drug, and if there's no other drug available, that's it, right? They, you cannot save your patient. However, if we study drug resistance, and we can do that, uh, we can figure out the mechanism, and perhaps design newer antivirals for which there's less resistance. So let's talk a bit about the basis for this. Uh, as you know, all, all polymerases make mistakes, and RNA viruses are the masters. Most of them have no error correction mechanisms. The, there's an asterisk here to remind you that the coronaviruses do have error correction machineries. And the, these polymerases make a mistake every 10,000 to 100,000 bases polymerized. That's about a million times higher than DNA genome. So in, a, in an RNA genome of 10 KB, this could lead to one change in every genome per replication cycle or every 10 genomes, depending on the frequency. Just imagine one, every time a, a genome replicates, it has a mistake. So, you know, a 10 KB genome you make more than 10,000 genomes per infected cell. You got the whole genome mutated in theory. So the, the nidovirales, which includes, that's an order. It includes coronavirus D. Uh, these genomes encode a proofreading exonuclease. There it is there. It, it's called XON. It's the product of M NSP14. It's, it's a protein fused to a methyl transferase here. And uh, here it is on the RNA. This is the RNA polymerase in red. And there's the primer, and it's copying the, the RNA, and that exo goes along with the complex. And if there's a, a mistake made, the exo will cut it out. So this reduces the error rate of, of coronaviruses, so that it's lower than other RNA viruses. But they still make mistakes. It just makes it harder to make certain kinds of antiviral drugs. Uh, for DNA viruses, uh, again, DNA polymerases make mistakes, but the polymerases have associated uh, exonucleases that will, just like the exo of the coronaviruses, they will detect the mismatch as shown here. Here we have a polymerase extending on a template. There's a mistake made. The exo detects it, cuts it out, and the polymerase fixes it. And so that's why these viruses make fewer errors, and that's why they evolve more slowly than RNA viruses do. And we'll talk much more about this next time when we talk about evolution. So I want to go through some of these different inhibitors and explain how they work. Uh, 
and how resistance arises. And we'll start with attachment and entry and go through the various steps uh, for which we have good examples. So let's look at entry. This was the first antiviral I described to you, discovered in the 60s uh, for influenza viruses. And uh, there's the compound there. It interacts with the influenza viral M2 protein. Now, M2 protein, remember, is an ion channel. It is present in the virus particle. Uh, and there it is right there, just one of them in that particle. It actually binds in the channel and prevents protons from going through. Now, if you remember, we talked about this during entry. During endocytosis, the endosome acidifies because protons are being pumped into the endosome. Those protons also go into the interior of the virus particle, and they get there by passing through the M2 ion channel. And the interior then becomes acidified, and that allows the ribonucleic proteins of the virus to get out and go into the nucleus after fusion occurs. So you block the channel, you block entry of protons into the virus particle interior, and therefore uncoating is blocked. The RNAs are not released. That's how these inhibit infection. And here's a, a close-up structure of the M2 channel. It's a tetramer, small protein. It just crosses the, the phospholipid bilayer. The protons go through it uh, from the endosome into the interior of the particle. And here is amantadine in red. It is binding. It actually binds outside of the channel, but also inside the channel and blocks the transitive protein, interacts with uh, the side chains of certain amino acids. Uh, and that's how it inhibits entry. And of course, you get resistance to amantadine. You, you simply uh, have to change these amino acids. One amino acid is enough. It will either prevent the amantadine uh, from binding, or it will still allow proteins to pass through even in the presence of amantadine. So resistance happens very readily, and that's why we don't use it anymore. Another entry inhibitor is for HIV-1. It's a drug called Maraviroc, and it's an inhibitor of CCR5. I don't know if you remember CCR5, but it is the co-receptor, one of the co-receptors for entry. The GP120 of the virus has to bind first CD4 and then uh, CCR5 to get high affinity binding. And Maraviroc is shown right here. It's a small molecule which binds into CCR5. This is a structure of CCR5 here in orange. Maraviroc is in blue. And it binds and prevents a GP120 from binding. So HIV will bind CD4, but it will not bind CCR5, and so entry is blocked. Of course, you get resistance to that one as well. Another entry inhibitor is hydroxychloroquine. I thought you'd like to know why it failed. So hydroxychloroquine has actually, it's a licensed drug, and one of the licensures is for malaria treatment. Okay, so it is an approved drug. We use it in the lab to inhibit the infection of many viruses. It inhibits endosomal acidification. It, it, it raises the pH of endosomes, right? And so as you might guess, that would inhibit the entry of many viruses. So early last year, a lab published a paper uh, showing that you could inhibit the reproduction of SARS-CoV-2 in cells and culture using hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and then there was a very small observational study done in France suggesting that it inhibited viral loads in patients. And then under pressure from the administration, the FDA gave it emergency use approval without any further trials. It failed. It doesn't make patients better. It doesn't reverse their infection. It doesn't improve the disease at all. And the EUA was withdrawn. And that was an example of the FDA failing. They, they caved to pressure from the administration. It turns out that the cells in culture where they did this experiment, they, did, they used cells that were kidney cells, irrelevant to lung infection. So in cells in culture, hydroxychloroquine will inhibit acidification of the endosome. So the virus binds to ACE2, goes in by endocytosis, uh, and then uh, the, the endosome fuses, releasing the genome. And hydroxychloroquine will, will inhibit that. It does so actually by inhibiting uh, cathepsinella, a protease needed to cleave the spike. The, the viruses don't fuse by an acid-dependent mechanism, but rather 
by cleavage of the spike by cathepsin L, which exposes the fusion protein. So hydroxychloroquine inhibits that in kidney cells and culture very nicely. The problem is that lung cell cultures have a second entry route for the virus. They have a cell surface protease called Tempress 2, which will cleave the spike and allow fusion at the cell surface. This is not inhibited by hydroxychloroquine. So in your lung cells, yeah, hydroxychloroquine inhibits endosome acidification, but the virus enters at the surface. That's why it does no good. And, you know, what's the moral? Do the right experiment. Use the right cells. If they had done respiratory epithelial cells in that first paper, they would have found that it didn't work. So there is actually a protease that will inhibit Tempress too, but you can't use it by itself because then the virus will get in via endocytosis. So you could try both, and they were going to do that study, but it was canceled because of the bad, uh, some of the side effects that HCQ caused in patients. So that's a good story t- for you to understand. Uh, let's move to the polymerase. Here we have um, a, an anti-herpes simplex virus drug, a cyclovir. This is a great drug. We call it a prodrug and a nucleoside analog. Uh, many antivirals are either nucleoside, which means they have no phosphate, or nucleotide analogs, which means they have between one and three phosphates. So here are the four bases you need to make nucleus nucleic acids. And of course, if if it's RNA, you would use U, of course, instead of T. We can modify each of these chemically to make all these derivatives, which are shown in this figure, to make inhibitors of polymerases that work in different ways. So here's acyclovir and a derivative of it called gancyclovir. So acyclovir, you see, um, it looks pretty much like guanosine, except uh, most of the ribose ring has been removed. And in particular, this hydroxyl is gone, and that's where the next base would be added. So this is acting as a chain terminator. And it's a prodrug. Well, here's why it's a prodrug. You take this, uh, uh, you put this on a cold sore, say, and uh, it gets into your cells, and nothing will happen unless those cells are infected with herpes simplex virus, and that virus encodes a, an enzyme called thymidine kinase, which will phosphorylate acyclovir. No cellular kinase will phosphorylate it. So that's brilliant because this drug only works in virus-infected cells, so it's very low side effects. So you put one phosphate on by the TK, and then the cell will take over. Two cellular kinases will then add the second and third phosphates. You need three, of course, to be incorporated. It gets incorporated by the viral DNA polymerase into growing DNA chains, but that's the end of the story can't be extended. It's a chain terminator because there's no hydroxyl to add the next base on. So the DNA synthesis stops and you inhibit virus reproduction. So it's a prodrug because it has to be further modified, that is, has to be phosphorylated before it's actually incorporated into DNA. Now that uh, drug was not very orally bioavailable, uh, acyclovir. You typically would put it on cold sores as an ointment. So they made a derivative called valacyclovir, uh, which is a ester derivative, which you can take orally and treat infections that way. And so it's simply made by adding valine onto acyclovir. And that act alone makes it orally bioavailable. It's taken up into cells, and then the cell, there are cellular enzymes that cleave off the valine and give you acyclovir. Isn't that nice? And then acyclovir uh, will be phosphorylated if it's a herpes virus infected cell. So it's a very nice drug, very effective, very safe. Of course, we get resistance. Uh, these r- resistant viruses arise spontaneously, of course. Uh, they may be there before and simply be amplified. And they come in two classes. Some of the mutants cannot phosphorylate. So there are changes in the TK. They can no longer recognize acyclovir and phosphorylate. So that makes the, the, it ineffective. And then there are viruses with mutations in the viral DNA polymerase gene. They cannot incorporate incorporate the phosphorylated acyclovir into DNA. So you can have mutations in either of two targets, the TK gene or the DNA polymerase gene. And those could be a problem. We don't have a lot of herpes drugs. uh, So if you're treating disseminated infections, that can be an issue. Another target 
uh, is the reverse transcriptase. And of course, um, AZT was the first drug ever developed for HIV treatment. This was an existing drug that we had around that had been used in anti-tumor screens. Um, it is phosphorylated. It is, a, a again, a uh, nucleoside analog, no phosphates. Looks like this. And it is, and in fact, if you want to know where it's coming from, here it is. So it's a derivative of thymidine. It's taken up, phosphorylated multiple times by cellular kinases and then incorporated by the reverse transcriptase and uh, acts as a chain terminator because it has this nitrogen here, which of course can't be, uh, can't be used to add the next base. Now, what makes this selective? It's not a great substrate for most cellular polymerase. It's actually a better substrate for RT, but it's not completely selective as in the case of herpes simplex. So it has side effects, unlike acyclovir. Um, it is given orally, but the half-life is an hour. Can you imagine? One hour half-life. So you have to take this two or three times a day, and uh, this gave rise to mutants uh, initially. The, the story of this drug, by the way, is very nicely done in this movie, uh, Dallas Buyers Club, all about how you know initially they didn't have the dose right, and patients were splitting pills to share them because there wasn't enough to go around. And they helped inform uh, FDA about how much to actually use. So uh, as soon as this drug was licensed, immediately, Within weeks, there were there was resistance. Single amino acid changes at one of four sites in the RT around the active site. Uh, the altered proteins don't bind the phosphorylated ACT, so they don't incorporate it. So people then said, okay, let's make other nucleoside analogs, DDI, DDC, D4T, 3TC, one after another. And they started using them in combinations of two. But in less than a year, we had resistance to both of those two combinations. There are also non-nucleoside RT inhibitors. They are not incorporated by the polymerase. They bind away from the polymerase active site. So here is one of the nevirapine binding here away from the active site. They distort the enzyme so it doesn't work, basically. So non-nucleoside inhibitors, we have a couple of them, as you can see here. They're selected for the ability to not only bind the RT, but to inhibit uh, its activity. And of course, these, we also saw rapid resistance emerging, amino acid changes in, in any of the uh, sites around the binding site of these uh, inhibitors can block it from binding. So you, we no longer use these alone, but they're used in combination therapy, as you'll see later. All right, so what about SARS-CoV-2? So two inhibitors of the polymerase uh, are being looked at, and one of them is remdesivir. So here is, uh, is remdesivir, this big molecule. It is a prodrug of adenosine. Here's adenosine. So you can see adenosine in there. Uh, and then uh, this is uh, the modification of the molecule here. It acts as a churn chain terminator. It was actually developed in 2013 for the West African Ebola outbreak, but it turned out that the, the vaccine was more effective, so it was put on the shelf. Uh, it turns out it does inhibit a couple of different RNA viruses. Uh, it makes them sustain mutations. And... Um, Early last year, it was found to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 replication in cells. They did a few phase three trials. They got emergency use authorization. So this is an example of a drug that's being repurposed in a way, but it's got the unfortunate property that it has to be delivered intravenously. So by then, if you're in a hospital, you really don't have a virus problem, as I've said many times before. So this really had no effect on hospitalized COVID-19, and this pretty much shouldn't be used anymore. It's very expensive and really has little effect. So that's been a disappointment. But again, it was an existing drug, so we might as well test it. A more promising one, in my op opinion, is uh, molnupiravir, or EIDD2801. It is a prodrug of, of a cytidine nucleoside analog. So here's cytidine. Uh, they originally made this compound, which uh, you can see has an, a hydroxyl uh, stuck up here, uh, and this uh, C templates as U, and so it introduces mutations into the genome. Uh, this this compound, however, is um, phosphorylated and inactivated, so they added this modification here, which prevents that, and so this is the final drug. This inhibits multiple RNA viruses. It was found to inhibit uh, SARS-CoV-2 replication, both in cells and in mice last year. It was also shown to inhibit 
replication and transmission in ferrets last year. So it just went through a phase 2A in humans and, and inhibited virus, uh, pr presence of virus in, in, in 47 people. They were culture negative at, at five days after symptom onset when given the drug immediately at symptom onset. So a phase three is currently in process, progress. And the nice thing is that you can take this by mouth, right? So as soon as you feel symptoms, you get a test. And if you're positive, you could take this in theory. Now, why didn't we have this earlier? That's a good question. This drug was developed in 2015. Could have been tested against coronaviruses. We knew SARS like coronas were a threat. Nobody wanted to pay for it. We could have done a phase one and been ready. This could have stopped the outbreak. And we already had it. We didn't have to develop anything new. Meanwhile, many, many other drugs are being tested. But as I said, it's going to take a long time before they're available. Resistance to which antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme? Acyclovir, amantadine, penicillin, or all of the above? All right, which of these is a viral enzyme? Uh, which involve changes in an enzyme? Well, penicillin you can throw away because it's, it's an antimicrobial, right? And so that rules out all of the above automatically. And amantadine is just a channel, right, through which the proton is not an enzyme. So that leaves acyclovir, which could, you could have mutations in the gene for either TK or the polymerase to give you resistance to that. All right, moving in the infectious cycle, we have integrase inhibitors. Right, a couple of these, raltegravir, daltegravir. You know, the vir at the end means it's targeting the virus, right? That's the only part I get. Anyway, this is the integrase reaction. Remember, the retroviral DNA sits on the integrase and then the target DNA is nicked and then you have ligation and repair. So what these two drugs do is they sit in the active site. Here is uh, the active site with no drug. So this is, um, this is nucleic acid here, viral nucleic acid. And here is with um, one of the drugs in... in uh, in pink, that's raltegravir and deltegravir, dutegravir, I can't even remember the name, DTG. It's in cyan there. It's sitting in the active site and it deforms it so that this um, nicking and ligation reaction can't occur. It's one of the more recent ones developed and they're very good. But you can't use them alone because you get resistance. Not too many years ago, after people figured out uh, how to propagate hep C in culture, many antivirals began to be developed for hep C. Here's a RNA polymerase inhibitor, sofosbuvir. This is a prodrug, which gets uh, modified to form the drug, which is then uh, phosphorylated to give the, the active compound. Um, it gets modified. You see this phosphate that's in here, it's, it's protected by this ring and this other chain. Um, and then this is removed. That leaves one phosphate. And then the cell only needs to add two more. So that what this does is allow it to get into cells, these blocking agents, because phosphates in general prevent things from getting into cells. So we put these modifiers on, it gets them in the cell, and then they're cleaved off. So very clever chemistry developed. This is very expensive, $1,000 per pill. A 12-week treatment would cost you 84 grand. But it cures the infection. The virus is gone. You know, you can, there's no latent infection here. Biloxivir is a new flu antiviral uh, developed, approved in 2018. You have to take it within 48 hours of symptom onset. It's an inhibitor of the endonuclease. Uh, so as you see, we have neuraminidase inhibitors for influenza, but this is the endonuclease. So we knew that and the endonuclease is needed to cleave host mRNAs to make the primers for mRNA synthesis. So people screened for inhibitors of the endo, and this is one that they came up with, baloxavir. And um, now we have more influenza antivirals. There are a lot of protease inhibitors out there. In the case of HIV, the protease is absolutely required for the production of infectious virions. The protease is, of course, encoded in the gag protein, PR, right there. It's brought into the growing particle. And then after the particle buds, the protease cleaves the precursor proteins, the precursor gag, to form the final particle. And that's absolutely essential for infectivity. And so uh, early on, people said, okay, here's one of the substrates for protease. Uh, the, the cleavage site in the polymerase G, uh, protein. So th these are the, the, the amino acids, leucine, asparagine, phenylalanine, proline, isoleucine, okay? And they said, let's model the transition state that we think happens uh, chemically here before the cleavage occurs. And then they made their first inhibitor based on this transition state. This wasn't very active, but they kept modifying it, and they ended up with this. 
ritonavir, which is the final inhibitor. So here's the HIV protease. The active site is in yellow and green. And there's the drug bound in the active site. It's actually a peptidomimetic. It looks like the protein, except it can't be cleaved. It gets in the active site. It stays there and inhibits the enzyme. There's a, there's a protease inhibitor for hep C. One of the viral proteins, NS3, is a protease that cleaves all these sites in the viral protein. This genome encodes a long polyprotein, very much like that of poliovirus. And uh, this NS3 cleaves a lot of these uh, sites, so it's essential for reproduction. And again, an inhibitor was developed, telaprevir, or there it is right there. It looks again like the protein binds in the active site. There it is in red. The active site amino acids are in yellow. And it stays in there and blocks the protease activity. Now, getting to the end of the reproduction cycle release, we have neuraminidase inhibitors, which inhibit virus release from cells. So remember, when influenza viruses bud from the plasma membrane, they're formed, and they the receptor for the hemagglutinin is sialic acid. So these viruses would remain on the cell surface if it were not cleared of sialic acid by the neuraminidase. So the neuraminidase is an enzyme that removes sialic acid from the, the membrane in the area of budding. So the virus particles can be released. And many years ago, 1976, investigators showed that if you inhibited the neuraminidase, you get chains of, of uh, influenza virus particles stuck to each other and stuck to the cell surface because these particles, the HA is binding to sialic acid on another particle. So inhibitors were designed based on the structure of sialic acid bound to neuraminidase. And they came up with two. Here's sialic acid, and here's its structure in the neuraminidase. It's the head of the neuraminidase is a tetramer, and there's the active site there, and, and the sialic acid is in there. And they designed these two, a zanamivir and oseltamivir, to be a mimic of sialic acid so they would fit in and they would inhibit the enzyme. Now, these are also called Relenza and Tamiflu. So how do they work? They mimic the ligand. So here is the neuraminidase, the purple Y. It's binding sialic acid in the active site to cleave it off. And Tamiflu and Zanamivir bind the active site. It turns out that Zanamivir looks more like sialic acid than does Oseltamivir or Tamiflu. You can see by the bell structure here. Closer you design your inhibitor to look like the natural compound, the less likely you are to get mutations to avoid binding because if you avoid drug binding, you're going to also avoid sialic acid binding and you'll never be infectious. And that's almost the case. So you get mutations to uh, Tamiflu resistance much more frequently than to Zanamivir. On the other hand, Zanamivir is also used much less because it's orally, it's uh, inhaled and, and many fewer, fewer people can, can do that. So we track uh, influenza virus resistance every year in the U.S., and the data are released by the CDC. And these are samples from uh, 2019 through 2020. There's so little flu this year that they haven't released any data yet on this. So here we're looking at resistance to Tamiflu. Paramivir is another neuraminidase inhibitor, different mechanism. And Zanamivir, and you can see, Zanamivir, there's, there's very little high-level resistance out of 2,400 uh, samples here that have been tested. There's low-level resistance, but for Tamiflu, there's a lot of high-level resistance already. And here's Biloxivir, the new one, 2,500 samples taken as of this date, but now there's resistance. It, they just had to look longer, and there's already Biloxivir uh, resistant out there. And as I said, the uh, mantidines are not used because everything is resistant to them. All right, which of the following targets for HIV antivirals inhibits the earliest step in infection? Nucleoside inhibitors, NNRTI, non-nucleoside RT inhibitors, CCR5 inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, or fusion inhibitors. So I didn't tell you about fusion inhibitors, but obviously that's an early step also. But which is the earliest stage of infection? Yeah, so CCR5, that's binding, right? That's the earliest step. Fusion is after binding, so that would not be the earliest step, and everything is even farther behind than that. Can we make broad-spectrum antivirals? I, I'll, I'll let you know what we have. We're not 
broad in the sense every virus, but we're getting close. So here's an example of an antiviral developed a number of years ago called LJ001. And you can see this has activity by pluses. This means it inhibits of all these different viruses. Minus RNA, plus RNA viruses, DNA viruses. So the only thing that the ones that are inhibited have in common is they all have an envelope. So the, only, the, the ones that are not inhibited, adenovirus, Coxsackie, and Rio, they don't have envelopes. So apparently this inhibitor targets the membrane, and that's what it does. There it is. It trashes the membrane of virus particles. So there is uh, a rhabdovirus VSV uh, inhibited with just the diluent. Particles are intact. Another compound that was not active, particles are intact. LJ001, the membrane's gone, and these are just the, the nucleocapsids. So it's, it inserts into the membrane and trashes it. It doesn't have toxicity because cell membranes are always turning over and they can repair themselves. However, this drug isn't going anywhere. It's just a proof of concept. You could make some broadly a uh, acting antivirals. Now I'm going to tell you two others that are broadly acting. First one, F favipiravir. Uh, this is a nucleoside analog. It's, a, it's an inhibitor of many RNA viruses. It targets the RNA polymerase. So here's the drug. It gets into cells, and then it's phosphorylated once and then twice and then three times to give you the uh, tr RTP, the uh, triphosphate. And then that's incorporated into uh, the growing chains and inhibits RNA synthesis. It inhibits all, all plus, many plus and minus RNA viruses. All these have been tested. So that's quite an array. It's also been tested for SARS-CoV-2, but it hasn't gotten very far. It's, it is licensed in Japan to treat uh, influenza, but it is uh, it has not been licensed here for reason, probably because the trials have not been done here. So that's an example. You could make some kind of nucleoside analog that would inhibit many RNA viruses. You just need to do the testing. And so something like this, if it inhibited many coronaviruses, could be useful in the next pandemic. All right, so for DNA viruses, here is one, sidofovir. Uh, that's what it looks like. Another, uh, and this is an acyclic cytosine phosphonate. And this inhibits all these DNA viruses, so that's quite nice. And the phosphate group uh, is, is interesting. This is a mimic of deoxycytidine monophosphate. So this makes it look like a monophosphate, and then it just needs to be phosphorylated twice to be incorporated into DNA. And the, the form with three phosphates, or I should say two real phosphates, so two additional phosphates after this, has higher affinity for DNA polymerases, which has been found to be a general property of these acyclic nucleotide analogs. Acyclic because, uh, you know, this is not, is not a cyclic molecule here. There's no ribose left anymore. So it's acyclic phospho uh, group here, phosphonate specifically. So you only have to phosphorylate it twice. This gets across the membrane, even with this P in here, and uh, it can it has a higher affinity for the for the viral polymerases. So those are two promising uh, broad spectrum. They're broader. They're not all viruses. I doubt we're going to get an all RNA and DNA virus inhibitor. But if we have just RNA or just DNA, that would be quite good. And hopefully these can be these or some uh, variation on them can be brought forward. All right. So let's talk about two stories of antiviral success and that is combination therapy for AIDS and hepatitis C. And uh, here we have all the uh, antivirals that we have for HIV and here for hepatitis C virus. Two very different reproduction cycles, but we have inhibitors at many steps uh, of the cycles. And this took many years to develop because we had time. And we had a lot of time because people are infected for life. And... Um, you can diagnose an infection and have plenty of time to treat it. So these are two great candidates. Of course, the difference is that you can never get rid of HIV by drug treatment alone because there's a latent reservoir, whereas for hep C, there is no such thing, and you can cure people of HCV. So we now use combination therapy to treat AIDS, highly active antiretroviral therapy. A person who is diagnosed with uh, HIV infection can live a full life taking these drugs. It's one pill with three inhibitors. They target different mechanisms. But again, it doesn't cure the infection. We have a latent reservoir, which consists of hematopoietic precursor cells in the bone marrow that have proviral DNA in them. You can never get rid of that. 
Now, this is a quite an interesting field now because if you are diagnosed uh, as positive, your your virus will be sequenced to see which inhibitors you should get because there are different combinations of three drugs. And we know the mutations that are out there which give rise to resistance. So we want to tailor your drug to fit you. There's no use giving you a drug for which you're already resistant. So you do a sequence on the patient and then you prescribe the drug routinely. So here's why triple therapy works. If you need one mutation for drug resistance and the virus is making an error every 10,000 bases, that means every 10,000 viruses, you have every base substituted. Uh, an infected person makes 10 to the 10th new viruses a day. That's HIV-1 specifically. So you're making a million viruses every day with resistance to one drug. Is it any surprise that you get resistance very quickly when you just use one drug? So how about two drugs? The uh, the, the chance of developing resistance is simply adding the exponents here. You need 10 to the 8th, so you're, you're still making 10 to the 10th viruses a day. You need 100 virus, you're making 100 viruses resistant to two drugs per day. But so it's still not impossible. But three drugs, you need 10 to the 12th viruses, which is more than you're making. And remember that as soon as you start, start taking, uh, these drugs, they suppress replication. So that's why three drugs work. Uh, the likelihood that you're going to get resistance is low. Now, this is not to say that there isn't resistance. And some people have resistance to all three drugs. But, and there, there's, there are viruses circulating that are out there that are resistant to all three. And that's why you need to sequence the viral genome before you treat a patient. These are all the drugs available uh, to treat HIV AIDS. And they're listed here roughly according to the year that they were developed, starting in 1987 with AZT. Uh, this was a, a very unique instance. Uh, the onset of this pandemic signaled to the FDA, you had to hurry up, you had to fast track drugs, and so they did so. So we have RT inhibitors, we have both nucleotide and nucleoside versions, we have non-nucleoside inhibitors, we have protease integrase entry inhibitors, and then we have our combinations which are all listed here. Uh, the, the first one was a tripla, and that's been followed by uh, many others. So these, in, in the most recent one, they're always developing new combinations, and they have various combinations of the, the inhibitors that were uh, shown above. Uh, this treatment saves lives. It's being distributed more and more in the areas that need it. The African region has more AIDS cases than anywhere else in the world, and they were initially under supplied with these drugs, but you can see the supply as of 2018. Uh, th this is the actual and projected numbers receiving antiretroviral therapy. So, you know, there are still people that don't get it, but we're doing much better than we did. And we are preventing deaths. 10 million adult deaths have been uh, averted so far. So this graph is adults, deaths. And this is the actual deaths, and, and these are the deaths averted on top. So you can see that's improved over the years. And uh, also, um, infections of children caused by mother-to-child transfer of the virus. We are averting more and more of them by giving the mother a dose of, of antiviral therapy to reduce the viral load just before birth and reduce the chance that the baby will be infected. We also do pre-exposure prophylaxis now, right? So what I've told you with the triple therapy is post-exposure. You get diagnosed and then you're treated after the fact, but... Within two weeks, the latent reservoir is established, so you can never get rid of it. You can prevent it from infecting you by pre-exposure. This is daily double therapy, two drugs for people at high risk for infection. And so you can take it every day, and it will prevent you being infected. It reduces sexual transmission risk by over 90%. So you know that with a condom can make it almost foolproof. Intravenous, it will also reduce the risk, but only by... 70% or so. When you put virus right into the blood, it's hard to stop it. So this was a big debate because we generally don't like to give healthy people drugs, but people were still engaging in, in risky behaviors. And so this helps to, to cut down the infection in those people. We've also seen amazing improvements in regimen, treatment regimens for hepatitis C. You know, before 2013, we were mainly giving patients interferon and ribavirin. That was the standard of care. And, you know, here is, it took up to 80 weeks 
to cure some patients. And many patients were never cured because they didn't respond to the interferon. You know, when you take interferon, you get interferon-like symptoms, flu-like symptoms, excuse me. And then you feel bad. So a lot of patients would just stop taking the interferon. And so that was not optimal, and that's why we worked hard to get other drugs. So the first were some inhibitors that we've talked about uh, in combination because uh, you, you can't replace the standard of care immediately until you show that your drug is better. So combinations still took a long time. And then finally, the trials were done to show that these drugs were better. And now in 2015, we started giving uh, combinations of, of two, and that reduced the treatment time. And now we can get the treatment down to something like 12 weeks or so with some of these treatments. We can get absolutely virus cure uh, in 12 weeks or so with these uh, double drug combinations. So it's just a great example of how you make a, a variety of drugs and using them in combination can overcome resistance. Monotherapy is not the answer. And so, you know, if we're lucky to have um, a single SARS-CoV-2 drug, it won't last long at the rate that this virus uh, undergoes mutation. We need to have more than one. So molnupiravir is promising, but it's not enough. There'll be resistance very soon after we start using that. And, you know, this is all a very difficult problem because we have a lot of genomes on the planet. For HIV, they're 10 to the 16th genomes. So there's already resistance out there to everything we have, and that's why we have to sequence your genome before we treat you. Um, but for many other viruses, resistance will continually be a problem. And so this is in part why approaches to find inhibitors of cellular targets are attractive because it reduces the uh, ability to become resistant, not completely because the virus can still change to uh, alter its interaction with a cell target, but it reduces it. So that completes our uh, discussion of therapeutics and prophylactics, vaccines and antivirals. Next time we're going to talk about evolution, you know, the driving forces of viral evolution, and that will set the stage to talk about emerging infections. Thank you.